okay, as it, as it usually goes with a, uh, an international conference, we start with some slight changes in the program and other announcements. The slight change in the program is that after my welcome, uh, Nikolas Manitakis, a uh, member of the organizing committee and working at the University of Athens, asked to have for two minutes to say something about uh, in regard with the university uh, and how it is connected to the subject of our conference. The second thing I wanted to say is basically an announcement. Uh, Judge Sicilianos will be talking in Greek, so those of you who are not able to follow uh, the introduction on a legal theme in Greek, in Greek are kindly invited to get a translation device at the entrance. So I think that in the meanwhile, everybody sat down. So let's start. Your Excellencies, the ambassadors of Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Norway. Esteemed colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is a true honor and a privilege to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee to the conference, the Greek case in the Council of Europe, a game changer for international law and human rights. Well over two years have passed since we first discussed the idea of organizing an international, interdisciplinary conference on the Greek case. This emblematic example of cooperation in the framework of the Council of Europe to uphold democratic values and human rights. I don't think that any of us participating in those first brainstorming sessions expected that our common efforts would result in such a rich, truly international and resolutely interdisciplinary program, bringing together scholars, researchers and experts from 14 countries across academic disciplines such as history, law, international relations and trauma studies. We are also delighted to host a number of Greek case witnesses torture survivors and activists of the period, whose presence will no doubt lead to interesting discussions to say the least. In 1967, literally in the middle of the Cold War, the Colonel's coup d'etat called the European democracies to action. Protests against the dictatorship's seizure of power were voiced in various ways and levels from European institutions and national parliaments to European citizens taking to the streets to demonstrate against the regime. Concrete actions were discussed by various bodies, with the Council of Europe taking the most determined and powerful stance. Upon the initiative of Denmark, Norway and Sweden, soon after joined by the Netherlands, a process started that would lead to Greece's forced withdrawal from the Council of Europe, exactly 50 years ago. Personally, I believe that in the Greek case, the adherence to democratic values, human rights and individual liberties proved to be much more than words. When all those values, rights and liberties were being brutally violated within the borders of an allied country, a call for action sounded throughout Western Europe. Democratic values, human rights and individual liberties thus became the pillars of the bridge that connected two geographically juxtaposed parts of the European continent, uniting Danish and Norwegian, Swedish and Dutch civil society and politicians with the Greek people struggling for freedom and democracy. <coughs> In the context of the Cold War, at a time when the commitment to these values and rights was one of the most important indicators that marked the division between good and bad governments and rule of law, the active engagement of many European people, European people and governments underlined that they did not only support these principles as a figure of speech, but through direct action that they saw them as the foundations of their very own societies that had to be defended. In a time when liberal democracy 
Individual rights and freedoms are again being challenged in some European countries and across the globe. When incidents of police violence are openly surfacing, <coughs> the themes and topics of this conference seem to be even more timely and relevant. Please allow me to thank, on behalf of the organizing institutes, at least some of the people and institutions that contributed to the success of our conference. First of all, a very special word of thanks to the Presidency of the Hellenic Republic for doing us the honor of placing this conference under the auspices of the President of the Hellenic Republic. We would also like to thank, the profusely, we would like to thank profusely the staff of all organizing institutions involved the Danish Institute, the Norwegian Institute, the Swedish Institute, the Dutch Institute, and the Marangopoulos Foundation for Human Rights. Furthermore, we sincerely thank our host, the University of Athens, for its hospitality and the great cooperation, as well as the Carlsberg Foundation for its generous support. Finally, we also would like to express our gratitude to the embassies of Norway and the Netherlands for offering the reception at the end of the opening. Thanking people individually is not an easy task, especially when so many wonderful colleagues and friends have been engaged in the long process of organizing this conference. Still, I have to at least mention and wholeheartedly thank those partners involved from the very beginning, and through them all the others, Kostis Kornetis, Anna Papaetti, and Nicolas Manitakis. It was a true pleasure meeting you and working with you. We are sincerely looking forward to our next common endeavor. Thank you very much. As announced, I will be very brief. Dear colleagues and honored guests, on behalf of the University of Athens, I would like to welcome you. We are truly very pleased to host this three-day international conference here at the central building of the university for many reasons. Let me just mention three. <coughs> the first one is that my university is strongly committed to international collaboration. So we are very happy to host academics and researchers for, from so many different countries. Also that for this event we have closely collaborated with the Dutch Institute of Athens, the Danish Institute of Athens, the Norwegian Institute of Athens, and the Swedish Institute of Athens. And we are also very uh, happy to host the uh, uh, Maragopoulos uh, uh, Foundation. The second reason is that the University of Athens is strongly committed to the principles of democracy and human rights. It is thus an honor for us to host a conference on such matters. And the third reason has to do with the history of the university. During the dictatorship, among the opponents to the junta regime, there were many students and a few professors, to be really honest, who opposed the regime. In February 1973, 4,000 students occupied the Faculty of Law, protesting against the Junta regime. And as you know, this was the first massive demonstration against the regime. Among these few professors, there was also Ferdinand Becleris, a professor of administrative law, who has been fired by the regime. And then he went to France and he lived as an exile. Professor Begleris was one of the witnesses who testified against the Junta at Strasbourg. So there is even a direct link between my university and uh, the case, the Greek case that we are going to study. So even for historical reasons, my university couldn't miss the opportunity to be associated with this conference. On behalf of the University of Athens, I would like to say that we are deeply honored by your presence, by the presence of all of you, and I hope we will have productive discussions during our sessions. Thank you. Then I would now like to give the floor to Her Excellency, the Ambassador of Sweden, Charlotte Sommelier.
Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here. And I would sincerely like to thank uh, all the four institutes for the valuable work you've done to plan this, and also to thank the Academy of Athens for hosting this event in your premises. In September 1967, the Swedish Prime Minister, Father Lander, explained why Sweden, Norway, and Denmark decided to raise the issue of human rights violations in Greece in the Council of Europe. He said that this is a result of the Swedish government's efforts, and of course of the other government's efforts as well, to clarify to the world opinion how urgent it is to support democracy in Greece. The general opinion in Sweden was alarmed by the deteriorated human rights situation, and the civil society was mobilized. The reports of torture and other abuses in Greece were numerous, and there was a strong opinion against the military junta. For myself, I was very young at this time, in 1967, I was not born, but uh, I have seen pictures of uh, Olof Palme walking hand in hand with Melina Mercury in Stockholm during the 1st of May demonstrations. And I know how close the ties were between uh, Greek politicians uh, during this time and also, of course, the late Andreas Papandreou, who seek re refuge in Sweden with his family. In 1969, uh, on the 12th of December, 50 years ago, uh, my then former minister, Torsten Nilsson, was the first to speak at the uh, Council of Europe meeting to present the Scandinavian country's proposal for a suspension of the Greek membership because of the violations of the Council of Europe's principles. The suspension would apply until Greece restored democracy. Foreign Minister Nilsson referred to the recommendations of the Advisory Assembly and explained that the position of the Council of Europe would be seriously weakened if their recommendations were not respected. And shortly thereafter, the then Foreign <coughs> Minister Panayotis Pipinellis announced that Greece would leave the Council of Europe. Now, this is 50 years ago. Two days ago, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Charter of the Fundamental Rights and the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Right of the Child. And I'd like us here also to recall these days. And since we are approaching Christmas, and Christmas is a season many of us relate to love, generosity, and peace, we must also reflect more broadly in our society on human rights. These are values that we all gathered here tonight take for granted. Rights inherent to all human beings, regardless of race, sex, nationality, ethnicity, language, and religion. Freedom of opinion and expression, right to work and study. Sure. Protecting human rights has unfortunately become an even more critical issue nowadays. The number of countries that can be characterized as democracies has been reduced. The space for civil society is shrinking, and the crackdown against human rights defenders in many parts of the world are increasing. And many persons affected by human rights violations seek a better future in democracies where they can exercise their rights. And I think that countries like Greece, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands must work together within the European Union to better use the instruments at our disposal to promote and protect human rights in the world. Together we must ensure the implementation of EU's new action plan for human rights and democracy. With these words, I would like to wish you a very fruitful seminar and a very lovely end of this year. Thank you. May I, may I then now ask the His Excellency the Ambassador of Denmark, Klaus Holm, to take the floor now. Dear friends, I'm happy to be here today as well. 
for this conference. Um, looking back in the, at history, uh, I don't think that since the crowning of Prince Wilhelm of Denmark to become King George I of Greece way back in 1863, has Greek political affairs created so much attention as it did between 1967 and 1974. Actually, I remember it because I was born. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there are many, or there are some reasons, uh, definitely for for this period being so interesting. If you look at the uh, uh, the Danish tension towards uh, Greece, what well, the first one, the first reason is um, that the the young princess Anne Marie was uh, married to Constantine. Uh, <coughs> second, it's way back in, in 1964. I remember uh, this was one of the really the first big royal events on, on black and white television in my country, and I, I, I can I can vividly remember uh, watching this young princess in this huge wedding. The second reason that there was this interest uh, uh, on the, the coup and what happened in Greece was the removal of um, of uh, Prime Minister George Papandreou from power. Uh, that, that created some attention in Denmark, and it was widely reported also in, in the press, I remember. Um, a third reason is that the, the coup actually mobilized the, the democratic forces and the demo pro-democratic sentiments uh, that were widespread in Denmark at, at this period. You should remember it's, of course, the, the year before 68, so the young people were already at that time quite uh, a lot into, into looking at democracy. Uh, it was a period when they started this activist approach where they um, occupied the universities and, uh, and they demanded enhanced influence on, on, on the university and in workplaces and elsewhere. Um, so there was this pressure because of the interest in, in the coup, the pressure towards uh, the Danish government uh, that, that the government really had to react to this. and. Um, the interesting thing about it was that uh, we could have reacted to this in Greece, but we reacted in a multilateral way. We sort of multilateralized this problem. And uh, that was, of course, a more forceful way of dealing with it, um, instead of just going bilateral with, with Greece. Um, then there's also no doubt that the uh, abortive coup, or counter coup in 67, which led to Constantine and Anne Marie leaving Greece, uh, cleared the way for for what could actually be described as a national consensus that something must be done or should be done, um, and um, this also created this very proactive Danish response together with the other countries. Um, so, besides um, filing the case concerning um, violation by Greece uh, at the um, European Commission of Human Rights, together with Norway, Sweden, and, and the Netherlands. The matter was also uh, discussed in the European Council, of course, as, as we know, uh, which led to Greece leaving the European Council. But Denmark actually also raised this matter in NATO, so, so we, we tried to take a, a broader, multilateral approach to it. So, um, actually, this also led, this cooperation led to um, a debate or the, the start of, of a more in intensive debate among the Nordic countries about cooperating, actually creating some sort of a perhaps Nordic Union even. But uh, this is of course history because we never succeeded in doing that. So I was became members of the Union. But I want to assure you that the Nordic cooperation actually evolved very strongly since that time. And uh, actually the result that you see today is uh, this, con this conference, of course, together with our extended Nordic friends <laughs> from the Netherlands, <laughs> whom we, uh, we appreciate very much to cooperate with. So um, with these, what I would like to thank, thank of course, all the uh, organizers and sponsors for, for the work that made this conference happen. Um, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to the um, contributions that we are going to hear about this very interesting period in Greek history, in Nordic history and European history. Uh, and it's actually also a very interesting case of multilateral diplomacy. So thank you very much. Thank you.
And I would now like to invite Her Excellency, the Ambassador of the Netherlands, Stella Wonder Kurubachi, to take the floor. Thank you very much, and uh, Kalispera, uh, good evening to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear colleagues. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here uh, with you today at this international conference about the Greek case in the Council of Europe. And of course, me too, I'd like to thank the four institutes as well as the Marango Koulos for, um, uh, Foundation for, uh, for organizing this and making this possible. Um, I think it goes without saying that all of you here tonight uh, believe that this conference really covers a very special theme that is worth exploring for several reasons. Because of its legal importance, but also because of the human rights aspects that are related to it. Uh, both still are of great importance to all of us today. What I would like to focus on in my opening remarks is the Dutch role in this context when the military, military <coughs> junta overthrew the democratic regime in Greece in April 67, and I'm not going to tell you whether I was or was not. <laughs> <laughs> I leave it for you to decide. <laughs> Europe was taken by surprise. Uh, for the first time since the foundation of the Council of Europe in 1949, the concept of the collective guarantee of, of a pluralistic democracy the rule of law and human rights for which it had been set up was put to the test. At that time, Max van der Stoel, a well-known name here in Greece but in many other countries as well, obviously, was a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. He was appointed as rapporteur for what later became known, as I mentioned, as the Greek case. Max van der Stoel was fully aware of the profound significance of the Greek case for Europe and the Council of Europe. And he took his task as rapporteur very seriously. He visited Greece very often until the regime declared him persona non grata. The new military rulers of Greece claimed that they had seized power to prevent a communist takeover. As it became increasingly clear that the promises of the junta lacked credibility, Max van der Stoel's regular reports to the Parliamentary Assembly became more and more critical. Van der Stoel was also the first person to bring back from Greece clear and convincing evidence of the practice of torture by the regime. After heated debates, the Parliamentary Assembly finally recommended, it was mentioned already, the suspension of Greece from the Council of Europe to the Committee of Ministers. And the Greek Minister of Foreign Affairs, noting that the two-thirds majority for suspension was there, preempted it before the formal vote was taken by declaring the withdrawal of Greece from the Council. This had far-reaching negative political, diplomatic and economic consequences for the regime. The firm and principled act action taken by Van der Stoel made, in our view, a decisive contribution to the isolation and finally to the fall of the dictatorship in 1974. Since it was, and my Swedish colleague made mention of that already, it was also the International Day for Human Rights only two days ago, I, I would like to um, touch very briefly on the human rights aspects of this case. Of course, um, there were, uh, there were also other people uh, than Van der Stoel who played a, a big role in exposing uh, these uh, violations. Uh, apart from Van der Stoel, there was also a Dutch journalist, Ab Courant, a correspondent in Greece at the time for media both in the Netherlands and Belgium. During the regime, he was deported twice because of his reporting and he was also beaten up regularly. His critical attitude during the regime made him well known in Greece. And in 2008, he was actually honored by Greece with an order of merit. What Abkourant was most famous for was the video he made in November 73, at the exact moment the tank invaded the Polytechnical University, causing 24 dead and many wounded. The student uprising, 
uh, at the Polytechnical University marked the beginning of the end of the regime in 1974. And I believe the images of the video are, are well known to all of you. So let us honor and cherish and commemorate people like Apurant for their courage to expose human rights violations and through these people uh, let us honor human rights defenders all over the world. For without them, the, U the Council of Europe couldn't do its important work. On this, I would, like my previous, uh, like my colleagues before me, wish you indeed a very successful and fruitful conference. And thank you again for having me here. And then finally, I would like to ask His Excellency, the Ambassador of Norway, Brother Overland Foundation, to say some words to us. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, I think my predecessor has kind of emptied the subject for me. So um, <laughs> uh, it's now idle for me to declare if I was born in 1967 or not. So, but I will. I will go through some of the some of the issues I wanted to say first. Um, it's a great honor for me indeed to be here uh, on this uh, opening of the International Conference on the Greek Case for the Council of Europe with such a distinguished list of speakers. When the military junta overthrew the democracy in Greece in April 1967 and changed the country into a brutal dictatorship, Europe was shocked and appalled. And the issue soon emerged on the agenda of the Council of Europe. Public opinion and politicians in many countries, among, and among the Scandinavian countries in particular in Holland, made the fight for human rights in Greece a political priority. And I think <coughs> in many ways this can be seen as a prelude to what happened a few years later in 68 and 69 among, uh, among a lot of countries in terms of the awakening of whole political class of students. And I have to reveal I wasn't born at that time. <laughs> so I went to the, the primary source for my knowledge about the area, which is of course my father, being a professor in history. He was more than happy to enlighten me on the subject. And he, he actually went quite far saying that this, for a whole class of students at that time, this was the awakening, seeing that their activism could actually change something. And it meant something to the society that they, they actually put their personal activism into such a, such a, such a matter. And he drew a direct link between what happened in, in, uh, in Greece uh, and the later, of course, we were a bit slower in Norway in terms of rebellion. We all were always a bit slower in the north. So we didn't rebel until the early 70s. Um, well, it takes a bit of time. And he drew a direct link between sort of the activism we saw emerging from the Greek case uh, the political activism being born and what led to the students uprising in Norway in the 70s and of course we saying no to the European Union membership in 72. So he drew a direct link between the activism and what which was born at that so that activism really mattered that it could change the society, it could actually influence the whole society. And he drew a direct link between them which I think is very interesting and also something we should reflect on tonight. Uh, especially as my Dutch colleague uh, mentioned already, is that the charges brought by the Scandinavian countries and Holland uh, against Greece uh, under the European Convention of Human Rights and uh, also the documentation which was done under the European Human Rights Commission that indeed Greek, well, Greece at that time was torturing their own population. It's a very, very significant uh, step forward in terms of international pressure can put an agenda on, on, uh, on the, uh, can put an issue in the international agenda and can also be instrumental in documenting human rights breaches by uh, a government which can then be used as a case uh, for pressure in the international institution. And in our turbulent and transformative times where we have seen the challenges towards the, the role of uh, human rights in our societies and international affairs, I think it's very timely and relevant to reflect on these decisive historical moments in the protection of human rights, especially when we see human rights abuses throughout the world today, as my Swedish colleague very eloquently put it. Um, 
In concluding, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference and of course the University of Athens for, for hosting it and all the experts who will present their cases and their insights throughout the next few days. This is indeed a great and meaningful event and I would like to wish you the best of luck and it's an honor to be able to contribute to the conference in this way. Thank you.